Hey kids, welcome back to the Blackville. We don't usually do current events, but let's talk Ukraine loosely. Loosely, I want to use Ukraine to just remind you what's happening in America. Um, absolutely, my heart is with Ukrainians and President Zelensky. Um, very difficult times doesn't begin to cover. Assaults and basic concepts, um, balkanizing. The Balkan Peninsula was part of the old Ottoman Empire. Um, and the, the Balkan Peninsula collapsed because it kept getting divided into smaller and smaller fractured kingdoms and then city-states each pitted against the other. So when we use the word balkanize, balkanization, uh, or balkanizing, that's what we're referring to, is that taking of one powerful unified entity and doing the process of divide and conquer, that age-old political strategy that needs no explanation. And then war, when I was doing military things, what I learned is that war is the failure of other kinds of politics. That war is a political act uh, the Nazis would certainly agree, but even the American military, when you talk to the right people, will say war is a political act. And by and large, we would rather rely on other forms of politics because war is the most expensive and highest stakes kind of politics. Ukraine is really complicated. I'm not an expert, but my wife is an expert. Her college degree is literally, literally international affairs, Russian language and literature, and a focus on Ukraine. But this isn't our channel, so you're stuck with me. Uh, the things, that, the opinions that I've been forming through scholarship, I've run past her to just verify I'm not talking out the side of my neck on any of this stuff. We're in broad agreement about this. Um, but there is one thing going on that seems really clear, which is the balkanization of Ukraine as a means to take territory without needing to resort to war. Arguably, we get in this position in the first place because of the balkanization of the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union could not unify and hold all of the territory that it controlled up until 1989. Uh, and the Ukrainians, a proud people with their own ancestry and history, have never been part of Russia. They were part of the Soviet Union for a while, but not part of Russia. Um, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union until recently. Their government, until 2014, their government were Russian-backed, pro-Russia fascists. Uh, my use of the word fascist with the, with the small f uh, conforms to Umberto Eco's description of the Ur fascist. So when I say fascist or Nazi, unless I'm specifying uh, literal fascists and literal Nazis, this is the this is the Echoian, um, if I can invent words today, Ur fascist. And of course, uh, Putin is a Leninist, minus the Marxist communist overtones. You know, all of the propaganda and strategy to keep and maintain power with none of the concern for the people, which ultimately is, is, is fascism. Um, so Ukraine voted the commies out a few years ago and then basically chased them out of the country with pitchforks and fire. Uh, they replaced them with a comedian much in the, in the vein of our own John Stewart. That's the thing you're hearing around the around the media right now. Zelensky was an actor famous for playing a comedian who accidentally gets elected president. And now he's a comedian who was elected president. Uh, and he's sort of leading the, leading the war effort, the resistance in Ukraine. So that is all weird and wonderful. Um, uh, they're a democracy. Ukraine is a democracy now, a real thriving democracy. Uh, I don't know what's in Putin's head. I suspect that pisses him off. And they were cruising towards a probable, possible NATO membership. 
uh, Yanukovych, uh, he was the the president, um, 2010 to 2014 time period. Really threw a wrench, really threw a wrench in those works in 2010. But they threw him out for corruption in 2014 and, and reestablished their 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 democratic priorities and principles and the people have been demanding nato membership this process has been slowly incrementally creeping forward they adjusted their constitution so that it would allow for membership in nato and uh that is probably likely what's motivating putin um Russia has been declining in relevance since 1989. Sort of the rumors are Putin really wants to be relevant, a world power. A lot of my geopolitics people think that. I'll believe it, really, when... I guess if Putin told me, I wouldn't even believe him. Um, but it's a thing that's, it's a thing that's possible. Uh, but... Russia declining in relevance for the last almost four, almost, yeah, solidly 30 years. Um, this would be another nail in that coffin, right? And having NATO on your, on your doorstep, sharing a border with a NATO country, uh, Putin just could not, could not sanction that. So NATO... Uh, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization formed after the horrors of World War II, and it is a mutual defense pact. It's an agreement between European countries that there would never again be Nazis. Yeah. We would not capitulate to Nazis. We would not appease Nazis. And we would defend one another from the outset. Rather than giving Nazis elbow room, and ceding territory to them uh, in response to their threats and demands, we would resist them from the outset. And an attack on any NATO country is an attack on NATO, and thus on all NATO countries. We will rush to each other's rush to each other's defense. Ukraine joining NATO. See, this is why this is why Putin would think that was uh, why that was bad for years. Uh, Russia under Putin have been balkanizing the Ukraine. Fake news, um, political rallies, violent sedition, puppet governments, uh, even a sort of slow motion civil war that it's not quite a cold war, but it's not hot enough that it gathers a lot of media attention in the so-called West. Simmering tensions, occasional outbursts. The men doing the agitating are pretty sketchy. Uh, men with guns riling things up. Um, when reporters talk to them, when Ukrainians talk to them, uh, Ukrainian and Russian are not the same language. They share a language root, a relatively recent language root, so that if you speak Russian pretty much, I understand you can get by in Ukraine and, and vice versa but they're clearly not the same language. And the people doing this agitation don't speak Ukrainian, they speak Russian. Uh, I understand most Ukrainians over a certain age speak Russian from the hegemonizing influences of the Soviet Union. And under a certain age, people don't really speak Russian or don't speak it that well. And the people doing the agitation speak Russian, but not Ukrainian, because Russians don't speak Ukrainian, even though Ukrainians often speak Russian. So there's that. They don't have Ukrainian IDs. And when a journalist puts a camera in their face and says, are you a Russian? Of course, they demur. They don't demur, demur. They don't say anything. Um, they, they, they either deny outright they're a Russian or they say things around the question that don't answer the question. Um, whatever Putin's hopes for, a, for support from a Trump administration uh, those are all allegations at this point. I don't know what's in anybody's head. Uh, there aren't really, uh, a, 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 there, there's not a substantial set of facts on record that I'd feel comfortable leaning on for this kind of talk. Although Fox News over the last week or so has been working very hard, especially in the night when it's pure propo, to sort of prove those allegations true to the best of their ability by supporting Putin 
Um, yeah, right. <sighs> but his hopes that Ukraine would just flip over because he asked them to, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. He thought that he had a lot more support than he did in Ukraine. He sent the men to stand on the border, and then he sent the cruise missiles, and then he sent the tanks. And he's meeting a lot of resistance that he apparently seems not to have expected to meet. And even though some of the outer provinces have devolved into chaos, uh, some percentage of the people there want to flip, and these agitators have them convinced that they have flipped to the Russian side, but they haven't, not completely. And in the, in the center provinces, none of that, none of that at all. Um, right. So he was counting all, he was counting on all that. And when he was moving troops into position, those border provinces, you know, rebelled, rebelled softly, somewhere between soft and hard, creating just enough chaos that the tanks and troops could move over the borders relatively unopposed and get into the heart of Ukraine, relatively unopposed. But in the heart of Ukraine, they're meeting a lot of civilian and military opposition. Just men and women standing in front of the in front of the tanks. Gets me right there. Gets me right there. By 2012. That's that's Ukraine. That's Ukraine. For now. And I don't want to uh, I don't I don't want to prognosticate because since November of 2016, what I've learned is I have entirely too much faith in humanity. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm, I'm 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 wrong. We don't have the will uh, to resist liars and cheats and frauds and Nazis. Um, but so far, so far, the resistance is reportedly pretty stiff and the Ukrainian people pretty resolved. All this is having a, a, a rebound effect. It seems that maybe, possibly, an interpretation is that Putin is surrounded by yes-men, psychophants, who just tell him whatever it seems he wants to hear. He's increasingly isolated in Moscow. He spends most of his time at his dasha instead of at the, at the Kremlin. Um, and, the, and the Russian people oppose this war, and most of his puppet ministers oppose the war, uh, most of the people doing the fighting, most of the Russians out there don't know what they're fighting for or why. Um, yeah, and I don't, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to prognosticate. Anything could happen. Ukraine could fall tomorrow. It could, it could last. But it seems to have had this, this rebound effect where a previously weakened and fractured NATO seize the Nazis. I mean, these Nazis are ostensibly communists, but they're fucking Nazis and unifies around a country that's not even a NATO member yet. That's Ukraine. I'm American. And I want to talk about us, the US. By 2012, it was becoming really, really clear that our social media platforms were liability. If I remember, I'll link you some of the better like TED and TEDx talks on this topic, um, for what those are worth, just have a look at them. They're pretty good investigative journalism on how uh, how the algorithms work, how they get uh, exploited, and how, in particular, Facebook's secret advertising features, where you can advertise to some people and no one else will see those ads. Um, we're used especially in England. Uh, these things are a cheap way in 2012 for the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and arguably the Palestinians to spread disinformation and misinformation through the U.S. to divide us up, to get us hot and heavy on so many issues we can't focus on an issue. And because democracy, democracy only works when the population is educated, well, if you can anti-educate us and we we need information to make sane decisions this is perhaps putin's problem is he lacks information because he's surrounded by yes men and so you know there's a lot of debate is he a rational actor or not i don't know if he's a rational actor but rationality requires information and that's why america has been making a lot of irrational 
decisions lately. Russia's a small economy. It hardly ranks in the world anymore, except in terms of a nuclear arsenal. To compete with the U.S., they cannot come up to our level economically, uh, militarily, except for the nukes. But they can make the U.S. as irrelevant as they are by balkanizing us, setting us squabbling among, amongst ourselves and making decisions that set us back, uh, set us back decades that weaken us by weakening NATO, weakening Europe. Again, it's common knowledge that the Russians in particular amplified both sides of every issue um, or flat invented another side of really non-contentious issues. Uh, working with the NRA, for example, when there's a mass shooting to make a mass shooting a two sides issue, on one side is preserving life, on the other side is Preserving profits for gun companies? No, 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 let's call it freedom. Let's just call that freedom. And slowly driving us insane. Uh, they went into Facebook. They created Facebook interest groups. They bought ads, um, organized events. Some of the Black Lives Matter events were set up. I don't think any actually made it to the street, but there were activists, Russian activists, posing as Black Americans trying to get people amped up and go to those rallies. And I think all or almost all of those were caught ahead of time. But amplify, amplify every issue, fracture us, fragment us, and make the irrational seem, uh, make the irrational seem rational. While we're busily balkanizing, we're not able to unify appropriately around Ukraine or Taiwan, or Syria, or Tibet, or Iraq. We can't present a unified front to China, and therefore we can't deal with North Korea appropriately. And Taiwan is scared. We lack the standing. We lack the standing to even start to approach Myanmar, whose military overthrew a democratically elected government just a couple years ago. We're isolated. Before 2016, the Russians were isolated, and now it's us. We're isolated. Uh, the Ukrainian crisis is surprisingly, in some ways, our re-entry appropriately into the world stage, not as a monolithic singular leader, but as a part of a pro-democracy group of democratic nations willing to draw and hold a line. And by 2016, it was absolutely clear we did not need Russian influence. Like, is Trump a Russian asset? He doesn't need to be. Russian, the Russian, the Republican leadership infected with Michael Flynn and Paul Manafort um, the Trump campaign was losing. They were losing hard. They had no experience. They were surrounded by grifters and trolls. And then Manafort shows up kind of out of the blue and offers to run Trump's campaign for free. Manafort is a very, very expensive operative. Why would he? Never mind that. He, he does. He offers to run the campaign for free, which is really what Trump is willing. That's the right price for Donald Trump. He doesn't pay his bills anyway. Um, they bring him in. And between Flynn and Manafort, all of the Soviet-style Leninist dirty tricks campaigns get started. And get started? Get amplified. And Roger Stone and Corey Lewandowski, they are on board to do old-school um, Nixon-style dirty tricks campaigns. They adopted all of the worst practices of our enemies for their own ends. This version of conservative Republicans benefit from chaos, just the way that Russia benefits from chaos. Russia benefits from American chaos and the American fascist version of conservatism benefits from chaos. These are not good decisions. 
and people will only make the decide to vote Trump in a place where real information is not available. To be clear, Manafort is a Russian agent. Manafort's a Russian agent. He worked on the Yanukovych campaign from 04 until 2010. And this is that puppet regime that Zelensky eventually replaced in 14 with that overwhelming support from the people. Yanukovych, after this, fled to Russia, uh, tried to take a bunch of money with him, and the, uh, the Ukrainians chased him with pitchforks and fire. So Russia's not sending an army here to hold territory. I don't think anyone's really worried about that, at least not at this moment in world history. But they don't need to invade us. They don't need to. War isn't necessary. Um, you do war only when, when all other political measures have failed, and it just isn't necessary. America's sidelined. We've sidelined ourselves. They've won because we're breaking apart. The U.S. is breaking apart the same way the Soviet Union did in 1989. 1989 was supposed to be the end of history. And since Trump 2016, we're witnessing what the geopolitics guys call the end of the end of history. We're doing it to ourselves. Well, a tiny minority in control of most of the media, the social media in particular, um, they've managed to move the Overton window so far to the right that Nazis are bad is no longer a non-controversial statement. Yeah. It used to be you could say Nazis are bad, and everyone would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, throw Nazis are bad on your Twitter and see how long it is before some right-wing apologist has questions. Or suggests that actually uh, universal health care is Nazism. We were always vulnerable to this. America isn't a culture. We're like 11 really distinct cultures in a trench coat pretending to be a culture. It's easy to divide us up along those, along those lines, like the East Texas conservative Christian nationalist versus the Southern California border town versus the East versus the West Coast, ketchup versus salsa. All you need to do is amplify every issue. In particular, if you're on the fascist side of things, take the wrong side of every issue. Take the wrong side of every issue. Lie at every opportunity. Um, support the least rational crowd. You'll have their undying loyalty and all of the so-called earned media that you can use. This is why, arguably, why CNN covered all of the Trump rallies in 2016 from wall to wall. Like, Trump was allowed to just talk and talk, all of, all of his rallies, live broadcast, um, with really minimal interruption from journalists or fact checkers. This was so-called earned media. Again, it won't be Russian soldiers arriving to hold territory in the transparent guise of a peacekeeping force. It'll be Republicans. They'll be dressed as cops and soldiers and militias and so on. But it's Republicans at this point, especially the far fascist Trumpy right that benefit from balkanization.